gateway to Oz. Under the rainbow, this is where it was. Hollyhocks and red ripe tomatoes. And churn homemade ice cream. Let me tell you, Kansas is more than tornadoes. It's the best part of Dorothy's dream. Today on Around Kansas, we start with our wildlife segment about ticks and how to prevent them from biting you. Next, we'll have a look at teacups and their many varieties. Then we'll have a poem from Ron Wilson and we'll end with a look at dishes in China from kitchens of the past. Stay with us. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. This segment brought to you by Kansas Regenerative Medicine Center. Your stem cells, your health, your life. Good morning. Welcome to Around Kansas. I'm Deb Goodrich, your host, once again, coming to you from my High Plains kitchen. And honestly, why am I coming to you from my High Plains kitchen? Because my road is so muddy, I can't get the car out to go somewhere else. So... Here I am at home, but uh, it's kind of, it's always nice to spend a little time at home. My friend, um, Jenny Mithen, messaged me this morning to remind me that the World War I memorials are up at the historic Topeka Cemetery and will remain up through June 6th, I believe she said which of course is the 75th anniversary of D-Day. So next week we're going to have a lot of stuff on the D-Day celebration. I actually have a lot of friends who are going to be there for the uh, 75 uh, year anniversary of the invasion at Normandy. Um, and of course, uh, more information about our favorite son, Dwight D. Eisenhower, who um, orchestrated that uh Basically, a, a move that saved the world. Um, there's, I, that's not an exaggeration, I don't believe. So um, look forward to that next week and um, sharing some of your stories. So if you have stories of your family's involvement um, with D-Day, we'd, we'd love to hear those. So send me an email or send us a message on Facebook. I um, hope to see many of you at Blackjack this weekend. We're um, talking about two of my favorite Americans, and that would be J.E.B. Stewart and Colonel E.V. Sumner, later on General Sumner. Um, Sumner commanded the forces at Fort Leavenworth during the Bleeding Kansas era, and it's just one of my favorite people, uh, an amazing American. He... Uh, his dying breath was a toast to the United States, and I'm not sure what my dying breath will be, but I doubt that I'll be thinking about anything beyond myself at that point. So uh, what a patriotic American. So I'll be speaking on Sumner and Stewart on the Santa Fe Trail, and really looking forward to that. The military history along the trail, of course, is my favorite subject. So uh, really looking forward to seeing old friends and making some new ones at blackjack now um the weekend of june 8th there is going to be another special event on the santa fe trail and we'll have some more about that next week on the show but that will be um the dedication of the new interpretive markers at the um, rock creek crossing of the santa fe trail there near council grove so it's a really beautiful site the markers are just stunning they're they're really really gorgeous um god bless della orton the property owner for uh working with the park service the national park service and the santa fe trail association in making all this happen and hoping 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 that we can uh, make it to that event it's going to be a busy weekend because on june 9th that Sunday evening, I'll be in Hill City, Kansas, with a screening of Thoth's Dragon for the participants in the Biking Across Kansas event. And yes, Biking Across Kansas, we're going to do a segment on that next week, too. So um, I had a message from an old friend, uh, Ben Garrett, who uh, retired Army. Gosh, I was um, helping with media training at the uh, command college at Fort Leavenworth. 
and uh, Ben was a major back in those days and went on to work at the Pentagon and at um, at Post all around the world and so proud of his service and proud of him. And he actually was watching Doc Talk down in Georgia with his dad when um, Dr. Dan said, you know, catch our show online. And they flashed a picture of our website and there was a, a picture of Frankie and me with a round Kansas. And Ben was just flabbergasted sitting there with his dad and he said, I know her. Well, thanks for watching all our programs at Ag AM. Stay with us. Got a great show for you. To see this show and past episodes of Ag AM in Kansas, go online to agamincansas.com. This segment brought to you by the Western Kansas Wildlife Travel Center in Oakley. Well, with summer, warmer weather, yeah, maybe summer will get here one of these days. It seems to go from winter straight into summer with no spring, doesn't it? But we've got all those wonderful things to look forward to, you know, going out to the lake, hiking and fishing and all that good stuff. But lest we become too satisfied, we've got to watch out for ticks. And we've talked about snakes before, and of course, you know, keeping your eye out for for snakes and, and uh, other creatures that might, uh, might cause you harm. In all honesty, ticks are a lot more harmful than the snakes. Their track record is not very good. And I'm not sure why we have to have these little creatures on earth, kind of like cockroaches. What is their purpose? But we are going to share some tips for you when you're getting outdoors with uh, your family from the Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks, and Tourism and the Kansas Department of Health and Environment because they got a lot of concerns here too. So be careful and be aware. Pay attention. Spring and summer are hunting, fishing, camping, and hiking seasons. It is also the time of year when ticks are out. I keep getting reports that the number of ticks are above average this spring. While that evidence is not backed up by statistics, it is enough for me to be extra watchful. The Kansas Department of Health and Environment, KDHE, and the Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks, and Tourism, KDWPT, remind those spending time outdoors to take precautions to prevent tick bites. The ticks most often encountered in Kansas are the American dog tick, lone star tick, and black-legged or deer tick. Ticks can transmit diseases, including Lyme disease and Rocky Mountain spotted fever. People are encouraged to follow these steps to prevent tick bites. Dress, deet, avoid, and check. Dress. Wear protective clothing when practical, long sleeves and pants. Clothing should be light-colored to make ticks more visible. When hiking, Wear a long sleeve shirt tucked into pants, long pants tucked into high socks and over the ankle shoes to keep ticks out. Products containing permethrin, which kills ticks rather than merely repelling them, can be applied to clothing and equipment but not directly to skin. Garments must be allowed to dry thoroughly before wearing. Clothing and tents pre-treated with permethrin are available and the protection can remain active through several washings. Be sure to follow the label directions. DEET Insect repellents also reduce the risk of being bi bitten. When outdoors, use insect repellent containing 20% to 30% DEET on exposed skin and clothing for protection that lasts up to several hours. Again, follow the directions on the label. Avoid. Ticks are usually found on vegetation close to the ground. In addition to regular mowing, avoid wooded or bushy areas with tall grass and leaf litter and walk in the center of trails. Check. Check yourself at least every two hours for ticks when outside for extended periods of time. Pay special attention to areas in and around your hair, ears, armpits, groin, navel, and backs of the knees. Promptly remove a tick if one is found. 
The sooner a tick is removed, the less chance it will transmit a disease to its host. If you find a tick, grasp the tick with tweezers as close to the skin as possible and slowly pull it straight out. Do not crush or puncture the tick and try to avoid touching the tick with your bare hands. Thoroughly disinfect the bite area and wash your hands immediately after removal. Be sure to also examine pets and gear as ticks can ride into the home on animals, coats, backpacks, blankets, etc. Symptoms of tick-borne disease can include any unusual rash and unexplained flu-like symptoms, including fever, severe headaches, body aches, and dizziness. Prompt treatment with antibiotics can prevent serious illness or even death. See your doctor immediately if you have been bitten by a tick and experience any of those symptoms. I have friends who have experienced Lyme disease, and it is nothing to scoff at. It is a serious, challenging sickness, and you want to do everything in your power to enjoy the outdoors while avoiding the hazards brought by the little parasites lurking out there. Welcome to the Western Kansas Wildlife Travel Center, right here in my hometown of Oakley, Kansas. We're the front door of Western Kansas, located on three main highways, I-70, US-83, and US-40. And all those roads lead to history, beautiful scenery, and adventure, no matter which direction you go. We now have an IHOP that brand that you've trusted up and down the road in all your travels is staffed with local folks, real people, just like you and me, and we're waiting on you to join us. So for fun, adventure, fuel up, fuel your body, and let's have some fun. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. As fourth generation farmers themselves, Heinen Brothers Ag Service understands the risk and rewards of farming. So when it comes to quality aerial and ground application, fertilizer, ag chemicals, and anhydrous ammonia, call Heinen Brothers Ag today, 800-760-4964. Kim Mannering with Hardy Insurance. Today we will talk about employee safety and work comp coverage. On your farm, do you ask your friends to come help? Are they considered employees or neighbors helping neighbors? Did you know that you can be held responsible just as if it's a work comp accident? Give me a call, we can discuss. 316-945-6733. This segment brought to you by Kansas Regenerative Medicine Center. Your stem cells, your health, your life. Let's see if we can put the history of teacups in a cup. We all know that tea came from the Far East, where they drank their tea from a cup without handles, sometimes even brewing the tea in the same cup from which they drank it. For some reason, Europeans burned their fingers, unaccustomed as they were to drinking piping hot beverages, Ale, after all, is fine at room temps. The Chinese, being brilliant marketers and packagers, sent their beautiful porcelain teapots and cups with their tea to Europe. In fact, the tea was used to protect the porcelains, the blue and white classic designs that became standard in the homes of affluent Europeans. Eventually, though, they grew tired of importing pots and cups and thought, hmm, we can make this but their creations just couldn't take the heat, literally. Until, in 1707, a German alchemist mixed kale and clay into his porcelain, and a whole new industry was born. And in the process, cups got handles. While high tea and formal teas may seem a thing of the past, and the fancy tea service of our grandmother's era and before seems passé, there are still few pleasures as comforting as the beautiful brewed tea in a lovely porcelain cup. And as you are sipping, 
Whisper a word of thanks for that guy who put handles on the cups so that you don't burn your dainty fingers. Join us at the Butterfield Trail Museum and the Fort Wallace Museum for the Trails to Rails celebration July 12th, 13th, and 14th as once again Butterfield's Overland Dispatch Run stages on the Smoky Hill Trail from Russell Springs to Pond Creek Station at Wallace. Reliving history is a lot more fun than the folks had making it. My name is Karen Cope and I have multiple sclerosis. When you have MS, on the outside you look great. But you know what's really going on in the inside is chronic body pain, chronic fatigue. And there's lots of days that I'd wake up and say, well, please God, help me get through this day. You know, after stem cells, Chloe, my youngest daughter, she was asked by my father-in-law, how's your mom doing? And Chloe said, uh, Grandpa, I've never had a mom like this before because she was eight when, when I was diagnosed and she really had no other memory of me but being sick. It's really the simple things that we do as a family, like play cards and, and to be able to win at cards, you know, they all laugh because I used to, repeat myself and say, what hand are we on? You know, what's, where are we at? And it's just been really a, a true blessing from God and we're, we're really thankful. This segment brought to you by Kansas Soybean Commission. Progress powered by Kansas farmers. Perhaps we've seen horses with problems through the years, but I've come to find from my experience that oftentimes the problem isn't the horse, it's the writer. This poem is entitled, The Problem Horse, or The Horse's Problem. Here's part one. What's wrong with this horse, the young rider asked as he struggled with jobs for which he was tasked. She balks at the trailer, won't stand at the gates, and she doesn't move right when I want to train, change gates. She's skittish as heck and she spooks at my rope. I'm beginning to think this darn mare is a dope. I'm trying to get the work done that I need, but I can't make her start upon the right lead. Disgust and frustration fooled the cowboy's discourse as they asked the question, what's wrong with this horse? Here's part two. What's wrong with this rider, the mare must have thought as he went through the struggles the morning had brought. Does he want me to gallop or just go at a lope? Does he know that he whacked me upside with his rope? Do we stop at the gate or go on down the fence? What the heck does he want? His cues make no sense. Is he squeezing his knees because he wants to go fast? Or is his intent different than it was in the past? The mixed signals she got caused frustration inside her and the mare had to wonder, what's wrong with this rider? Happy trail. The Kansas Wheat Innovation Center in Manhattan is rediscovering ways to get improved varieties and new genetics in the hands of farmers faster. Grower-led and checkoff-funded research initiatives are bringing about positive change. This grassroots leadership provides a strong voice in Topeka and Washington, D.C. Now is the time to partner with Kansas Wheat in moving wheat forward. Kansas Wheat Commission and Kansas Association of Wheat Growers, farmers investing in their future and yours. Log on to rediscoverwheat.org. Sure Crop Fertilizers was started by my father, Don Sherman, and my mother, Shirley Sherman. Family business has started in the 80s. We predominantly focus on plant nutrients and what we can do to give growers better responses for with the fertilizer dollars that they do and what we can do to you know, make those things work better for the grower. We're based out of Seneca, Kansas. We work with growers in their soil analysis to figure out what they need, and then we can put those in a blend that gives them the best results and so that we can deliver that direct to their farm so that they have those nutrients where they need them, when they need them, and so that they can apply them in a manner that's, that's very efficient to them and, and works well on their planting systems and what they're doing. Sure Crop Fertilizers has been around for a long time. We always say we're, we're big enough to take care of everything you need, but we're small enough to do it quickly. You can get a hold of us at 1-800-635-4743. Um, our website is surecropfertilizers.com. And you can always email me at corey at surecropfertilizers.com. And with any questions you have, we'd be glad to answer and work with you. As fourth generation farmers themselves, Heinen Brothers Ag Service understands the risk and rewards of farming. So when it comes to quality aerial and ground application, fertilizer, ag chemicals, and anhydrous ammonia, call Heinen Brothers Ag today, 800-760-4964. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau. 
the voice of agriculture. To join today or more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Well, I'm just drying my drying my dishes here. A couple of these. This is a not that pretty. That's actually a pattern. I think maybe that's the hazel pattern. My granny had a bowl like that. And then here's one of my favorites. This is a Homer Laughlin. Homer Laughlin was a pottery, um, excuse me, a China factory um, started in 1871 in Ohio and then went across the river and founded the town of Newell, West Virginia, just so they could keep making it. There's uh, another one. They were making china for real people, you know, people who, uh, just ordinary housewives. And I started to do a segment. There's another Homer Laughlin. I just can't pass those up when I see them. I was going to do a segment on Homer Laughlin, and then I got to thinking about why I collect these pieces. You can see the dishes behind me. I'm always picking up china. I, I can't pass it up. And most of this stuff has no real value, no inherent value, but it's got a lot of sentimental value. So instead, I got to thinking about why this stuff matters to me. And I think, like many of you who collect, there's a real personal connection to some of these things. And that's what I'm sharing with you. The dinner tables of my childhood were works of art. There was no fine linen, no crystal, no silver candlesticks. But there were bowls with rose patterns and wheat stalk and ears of corn. There were white platters that were tinged brown from being warmed in the wood cook stove. Little chips on the edges bespoke decades of such meals. These bowls were filled with pinto beans, stewed potatoes, green beans, fried cabbage, fried sweet potatoes, salt pickles, dill pickles, chow chow, fried squash, corn, biscuits, and cornbread. Every meal was a sit-down meal, breakfast, dinner, and supper. Breakfast meant Grandpa's rising about 4 a.m. and building a fire in the cook stove. He would come back to bed, and an hour or so later, when the fire had warmed the kitchen, Granny rose. Her hair hung in a long braid down her back, and in her nightdress and housecoat, she took out her dough board and made biscuits. Sometimes she took bits of dough and shaped them into bears or babies in bunting bags and baked them for me. She put the coffee on to perk, an old aluminum coffee pot set on the wood stove with the basket full to the brim of Louisiana coffee. This was not coffee for the week. It was coffee that you could stand your spoon in. When the biscuits and coffee were done, Grandpa got up again, and Granny dressed, and we had breakfast, often eggs with red-eye gravy, and Grandpa took down his little cast-iron skillet and made his own eggs. After decades of life together, I'm not sure Granny could cook those eggs to suit him. The coffee cups always had saucers, because the hot coffee was poured into the saucer to cool, and Grandpa drank from the saucer, as was the custom with a lot of mountain folks. The dishes were then washed and put away, and Granny went about her morning chores, feeding chickens, gardening, and then making dinner. Thus, each day was spent. Granny's kitchen was the center of my life. It was nurturing and creative, sanctuary and refuge. Today, when I go through antique stores and thrift sales, I spy some of those 1930s and 40s dishes, dishes Granny was still using when I was a child, and I cannot resist their tugs at my heart. I rescue them and bring them home, and I use them. More often than not, our meals are not sit-down affairs. Rather, they are filling a plate and plopping in front of the television. But when I see those bowls and plates, cups and saucers, I see the patterns of my childhood, patterns of love and warmth. I see my granny filling them, washing them, stacking them in the cupboard, and I am once more in her kitchen. Folks, thank you so much for joining me on Around Kansas this morning. Be sure you like our Facebook page and follow us, and we share a few other things. And we share some pretty amazing photographs there, too. So we'd love to see yours, and especially storm season. One of the good things about storm season, man, we get some fantastic photos, and we love seeing those. So finish your coffee. We'll see you somewhere around Kansas.
Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. Ripe tomatoes and churned homemade ice cream. Let me tell you, Kansas is more than tornadoes. We're the best part of Dorothy's dream.